Hi, and welcome to episode two of the History Hut. I'm Jim. This is Dr. K. Uh, this week, we'll be talking about the Sung Dynasty, and we'll be taking a look at the impact of the Mongols. But the last time we spoke, we were talking about the Tang Dynasty, and we all know about the dynastic cycle. Uh, so, uh, so who's that's, next? That's right, Jim. I'm glad you got that from the last set, the dynastic cycle. Right next up is the Sung. Of course, we were talking about Emperor Wu last time, and then I think I said that the last 150 years or so of the Tang Dynasty, uh, it's a period where there's lots of chaos and the rise of gen different generals and pretty chaotic period but out of all that the the last emperor of the five dynasties died in 959 AD and he's replaced by a six-year-old and then the man who had been the advisor to the emperor uh, decided General Zhou decided to stage a coup and uh, took over and he named the next dynasty after the place that he had been stationed in and that was the Sung so that this this new guy takes on the the name uh, Tezu, T-A-I-Z-U, Tezu, and uh, names this dynasty the Sung Dynasty and establishes new capitals. So move away from Chang'an and uh, now up to Kaifeng and uh, Luoyang. Really capable guy, and, and so was the, the next guy in the dynasty as well. Ended about 80 years of warfare. And uh, he asked his generals, uh, he said he wouldn't become the leader unless they they would give up their military posts and become civilian <laughs> governors. I mean, that's a lot to ask from a general, but in the end, uh, they do actually do that. So you'd think that it would all be plain sailing here. You've got this new leader, new dynastic cycle, mandate of heaven, everything's going fine. But in fact, the big problem is that, you know, usually when we talk about China, we, we just talk about, you know, the dynastic cycle and we go from the Sui to the Tang to the to the Sung. But in this case, there's actually three groups of people massing, guess where? The north? In the north, in the north. Imagine that. The, north, yeah. the northeast and the northwest. And they're becoming really powerful as well. So the Sung actually have to deal with them. Uh, so these these three other powers. And it's the they're just to make things more complicated, they're known by different names. So I'll give you the three names that we generally, you know, talk about them. Um, the uh, the Liao, that's L-I-A-O, the Liao, and mm -hmm. they, they create a state. And uh, the Shishia, that's my favorite, I like saying that, Shishia. <laughs> And then Sounds the, the, delicious. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Uh, on a bed of rice. And um, the gin. Oh, yeah. yeah delicious the, once the again. Also, yeah. <laughs> also, yeah, Mother's Ruin. Uh, so they, they are all in the north, and they all become quite powerful uh, in their own right and not only fight with each other but fight with the Sung. So the Sung have a really, really hard time with them. Now, it's not as though they just emerge out of nowhere. And we'll be talking about that when we talk about the Mongols as well. It's not as though there's nothing there and then suddenly three groups emerge. These are people who have been in the area or have been pushed into the area and have been there for, for quite a while. So the Tang had actually dealt with the same three groups of people and sometimes they would ally with them against, you know, the others. Uh, and then at other times um, they would, the Tang would try and have diplomatic marriages and introduce civilization <laughs> uh, into these areas or they would just pay them off so they would they would have they i would, like that uh, option yeah i know <laughs> it's always the easiest Myself. one peace treaties so peace treaties and in one of them just to give you an example it involves huge amounts of uh well i, would, I say money but really it's other things uh in one of them it's usually silver and silk so in one instance um the tang had to hand over one hundred thousand tails of silver that's t-a-e-l-s and two hundred thousand bolt, bolts of silk so a tail of silver equals five foot of woven silk or 40 grams of silver or uh, like 400 weight of, of rice. So it's huge amounts of silver. I wouldn't stuff. have made it back then. I can't do it. <laughs> I mean, that. Yeah, and yeah, you have to carry it all as well. Oh. You'd be like, oh, could I just take mine in food? Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, soon that wasn't enough. Uh, that, you know, they would, they would not soon. Not I was going to, yeah. <laughs> yeah <that laughs> You're all enough. over the place here, uh, yeah, doctor. Yeah, it was terrible. So uh, sometimes the Shishia would ally with the Leo against the, the Soon. Other times they would ally, the Shishia would ally with the Soon against the Leo. And uh, really, 
it's very, very difficult for, for either the Sung or the Tang to uh, take down any one of these these three groups. So when you talk about China, really you have to think about, we're not just talking about the Tang and Sung period, we're actually talking about the period where there are these three you know, powerhouses to the north. So uh, just for instance, just a for instance, the Liao who are also called, just to confuse matters, the Kitan or the Kidan, mm. and you would see that if I could ever get you to read a book on history, you would see that, uh, but that won't be a problem for you. I don't think they have any comics about the no, Kitan. No, probably not. Probably not. Yeah. Um, so uh, the the Liao defeated um, one of the the Song emperors uh, Taizong four times in about a 30 year period, the 960s to the 970s, uh, and uh, actually invaded North uh, North China. And so uh, Taizong had to sue for peace. And as usual, it was the, you know, at least 100,000 tails of silver and, you know, so many I bolts tell you that this, this, the 60s and 70s just, were a crazy time. Oh, yeah, just man. a crazy it time. Nuts. So you could just imagine everybody be wearing the silk, like in headbands and stuff, and been all like, you know, woo, let's listen to the music all psychedelic. <laughs> Um, so in, in uh, 1044, the Leah are actually able to create to create their own state. So they create an actual state north of China. And this increases um, the, the cost of peace, of course, because they're, they're, they're stable up there. They don't have to, they're going to get run out. Uh, and so their state covers northern China and inner Mongolia. And they make the, the city of Yanqin, which later is Peking, uh, their headquarters. So you've got the Liao really, really you know stable up there. The Shishia, my favorites, the Shishia, they're pushed out of Tibet in about the 8th century. And the first time they show up in the written record is about uh, the 730s AD. And the Tang allow them to settle on their kind of northwestern border by the Ordos uh, Desert. So not a good area to become agriculturalists. You have to be, you know, hunters and farmers and warriors. And they took the Tang dynastic name uh, Li. So they're also used later on by the Sung as uh, allies against the Liao in uh, 1004. Uh, but then they're at war with the Sung and um, they, they ally with the Liao. And they found their own state in 1038. I don't mean they find it. I mean they found it in 1038. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Subtle raided, difference. Yeah. <laughs> raided. Raided Sung lands, and in in fact they become such a danger to the Sung that the Sung bring together this absolutely massive army, and then they split it probably unnecessarily into five groups and attack from five directions, and they're thrashed by the Shishia. It just unbelievable because of the sheer numbers that they, they bring to bear against them. The Shishir the numbers? Sh the Shishir. <laughs> and, and so the Sung loss and they accept the loss of some Sung territory to the Shishia. Uh, the, and, and really, um, the, the Sung are never able to take out the Leo. The Sung are never able to do anything against the Shishia. And uh, it, you have to really wait for the, the arrival of the Mongols and the scene to frighten the Shishia. Uh, and then the third group are the, are the Jin, who are also called the Jerkchen. But Jin, is your, and their third name is the Golden Tatars. Mm. Uh, so as long as you can remember that you take tartar sauce with your fish and chips and you're close enough to remembering <laughs> tartars, that's okay. You got that, so, people? Yeah, that's that's Tartar just, sauce just, you're just missing with, your, a, you're with just, your fish. Yeah, just, just yeah. Uh, so I'll have some golden tartar with that and yeah. don't expect that, you know, you'll, you'll get oh, a, a jinn person. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, get a jinn person. And so, uh, so the jinn first recorded in Chinese history in 903 AD. They're from Russia. They seem to have come in from about the Amur uh, River area. Uh, they're then to be found all the way from Russia to Korea, so just kind of take over that whole top area. Uh, their their HQ is uh, at Harbin, and they resist the Liao, who are just south of them. So they resist the Liao, wouldn't pay homage, and they actually start attacking the Liao state in about 1114. Not that the date's all that important, but still. Um, within about uh, another 12 or so years, Maybe even less than that. Uh, the Leo start to collapse and they begin to retreat from that area. And in 1125, the Jin are actual, actually able to completely humiliate the Leo and, and, and push them out of that uh, that area. And I was saying to somebody the other day that uh, they were trying to insult the Leo ruler, so they called him the, the king of the seashore. I'm like, whoa, that's a Ooh, har that, that's harsh. That eh? cuts deep. That's, I know, cut, I don't king know. of the seashore. Somebody called You're me that. You're just a shell. You're uh, yeah, king yeah. of the seashore, I guess, because the sea's always going out and the sand's not there sometimes because it's 
I don't mm. know, you know, what the deal is with it. I can think of better insults, but uh, you know, well, just, let's uh, you know, you, let, you let's can't not go there. The past. Let's not go there. You can't change the past. You can't just put words into the mouth that's of the, the gin. So that's what they they did anyway. So about eleven fifteen, the gin uh, they create a state for themselves as well. And of course, uh, they call themselves the, the gold dynasty or the golden, they're called the golden Tatars, but the Jinn as well. So they unify, they attack the Leo, push them west, and then they march south in 1127 and uh, capture the Sung Emperor and 3,000 of his closest friends, I think, all having a big party. Popular, they're like, no! Popular guy. Weekend at Bernie's. Um, so the, the surviving royal family uh, immediately get out of there and, and push south to uh, Hangzhou and so they this is the point and I hadn't mentioned this before because <gasps> it's too frightening um, you don't really just talk about the Sung you talk about the northern Sung and that's 960 to 1127 and then when they're pushed south by the Jin they're called the southern Sung so 1127 until they're finally taken out by Kublai Khan and uh, they, they their dynasty ends about 1279 so the Sung move south and uh, kind of uh, set up again uh, in, in the south at Hangzhou with their headquarters. Now, uh, the Jin don't change much because the Chinese system, and I think, I think we've made that point a few times, the Chinese administration, their system, their organization is just so phenomenal that people are just like, hey, why reinvent <laughs> the wheel, you know? Yeah. <laughs> this is, why bother? Uh, they're way better at us, uh, this than us. So they use the Chinese style to rule and, and there's not really much change. And this is the great thing, I suppose, about Chinese history is that it doesn't really matter who comes in you know you can outweigh them <laughs> and you're, you're just like at some point these guys are going to leave and it, everything's just going to be the same as it always was so um they do try and take the sung out again in the 1160s but they fail and then the sung get kind of cocky and in 1206 they come up and try and take the gin out and of course fail and so that costs them so it's actually going really well for the gin and not so well for uh the sung at all but like the shishia Poor Shishia. Oh, I, I want to keep talking about them forever. Uh, like the Shishia, the, uh, they're going to face the Mongols soon. So the, the southern Sung, they'll, they're actually kind of protected because they're further south. And so they're mm -hmm. not going to face the, the Mongols until the Mongols can batter their way through uh, the, this, this golden Tatar dynasty. So you're probably thinking to yourself, that sounds really unstable and catastrophic. Did the Sung even get anything done at <laughs> all? I mean, are they are they noted for anything? And that would just show me that you hadn't been reading, hadn't been following your, your course reading. Guilty um, as charged. <laughs> because although all this stuff I'm not even in the course, today, I'm just squatting. I know, <laughs> I know that's true. That's so true. You're just take that yeah. university. <laughs> oh or college. Or oh, that's terrible. Whatever institution <laughs> this class is being held in. <laughs> That's right, in a Cold War bunker. That's right. That's right, in the in a back garden somewhere in North America, just waiting for the, the nuclear holocaust. Hiding out from the, the that, gin. That's right, and the Mongols. I'm more scared of them than anybody else. <laughs> That's terrible, though. So the Sung actually do quite well. Uh, this is known as a period when uh, China has a green revolution. It's an incredible period of um, uh, technological change and innovation. You get uh, improvement in mathematics, in optics, in printing, in pottery. You get the use the the crossbow, the wheelbarrow, seismographic stuff. My favorite, the big ginormous, because that's a word, ginormous. Mm. Um, bronze vases with dragon's heads and, and each of the sides and a ball in them and when there's a, an earthquake the ball drops out so you could tell that there's earthquakes as that's far away tech. as Tibet yeah I mean and that's the kind of stuff you need to know you're like yeah what's going on in the outside world oops another earthquake yeah oh, too bad they must be destroyed sucks to be yeah. them that's terrible so uh, they, they actually do very well um, and probably in in the next session i'll give you a, just a couple of the highlights of the the soon period well i want to hear about these mongol folks but we'll we'll Ooh, talk we'll yeah. talk about that <laughs> my favorite part two of episode two of the history hut we'll see you there <laughs>